Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato, coming to you today from the studios of KUER NPR Utah in Salt Lake City. Later in the hour, inside the secret signals, plants send from leaf to leaf when danger strikes. But first, while Hurricane Florence is washing away homes and highways in the south, all that flooding not only devastates property, takes lives, but it severely impacts agriculture, and I'm talking about the soil. A 2011 report put out by Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts states if we don't take action, this rainfall pattern, quote, could cause soil erosion in Wisconsin to double by 2050 from 1990 rates. So what is the impact of changing climate on the soil? And what does this mean for the future of soil health? My next guest calls call soil the underdog of natural resources, and she's here to explain how we should be paying more attention to too much water. Well, uh, Andrea Beish is a, an agricultural scientist at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Welcome to Science Friday. Thanks for having me. So why do you call a soil the underdog natural resource? That's a great question, Ira. You know, I feel we give a lot of attention to water pollution and air quality, but infrequently do you hear about the imperative of soil. So I appreciate you and your team taking a segment to give us the opportunity to promote that. But water and air seem to get a lot more attention than soil. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about it now. Uh, You know, it's really interesting because when people talk about soil in the Midwest, in the West, they they look at the 1930s Dust Bowl drought as a major cause of soil erosion in the plains of the Midwest. But today, um, out in Nebraska, where you are, rain, it's too much rain is the problem. Well, too much rain isn't always the problem. Um, It can be sometimes too much of the problem. So, um, you know, just to put some of the soil numbers that we're seeing, uh, soil erosion numbers into context. Um, There have been several articles that summarize uh, erosion rates and soil formation rates. Um, David Montgomery uh, is a a great soils person, has written some really wonderful books about soils and society. And he estimates that soil formation rates, so how quickly soil forms, uh, to be happening at a rate of about less than half a ton of soil per acre per year. And let me just put that into context for you that research out of Iowa State University, where I went to graduate school, called the Daily Erosion Project, Uh, They produce daily estimates of erosion for parts of the upper Midwest, including parts of southeast Nebraska. And, you know, I was looking at some of the numbers recently, and they estimate that parts of southeast Nebraska in 2017 had over 30 tons of soil loss per acre per year. So, again, if we're thinking about formation rates being less than half a ton per acre per year, we're losing soil in one year that's going to take decades to replace. Um, And another example where I live in Lincoln, we've had a lot of rain this year. We've had um, about six inches of rain the beginning of this month. The Daily Erosion Project estimated some areas in the eastern part of the state of losing more than three tons per acre. That's just over a few days, right? So it's going to take several years to replace what was lost in just a few days. What, what does the, all this rain do to the structure of the soil? Right. So the force of rainfall hitting the soil can uh, break up the good aggregation that you have. And those soil aggregates, if you think about soil, it's kind of a matrix of particles and um, those aggregates being really critical to um, having good space in the soil for roots to grow, for water to infiltrate. As you have that declining structure, you have less opportunity for good uh, crop productivity. Um, You're also losing, you know, um, the most nutrient-rich part of the soil when you have that erosion. Um, So the the, the rich topsoil is going away with that, and that's leading to other problems like water pollution. So... um, so, yeah, the degradation um, being a, a risk for long-term productivity from an agricultural standpoint. Mm-hmm. We, we hear about planting cover crops as a way to protect soil health. How, how do cover crops help soils from these extreme events? 
Right. So that's something I've done a lot of research on. And I'll just take a step back for those folks who aren't familiar with what a cover crop is. It's basically a plant that you would grow when the soil would otherwise be bare to protect it. And so what that means in a place like the Corn Belt, you know, typically farmers are going to plant corn or soybean in the spring, in April or May. They're going to harvest in September or October. And that's another five or six months of the year when the soil is left bare, unprotected. Um, you're missing an opportunity to do what plants do, which is convert uh, sunlight into carbon, right? So what a cover crop does is to cover the soil in that bare period to protect it from things like uh, soil erosion. Uh, you're adding mm -hmm. carbon into the system when you're doing that. Um, some of the work that I've done has showed that cover crops can increase water infiltration. So that's the rate at which water can enter the soil. Um, right. Yeah. So I you're getting all of those benefits in terms of um, soil protection and really to building resilience and buffering a soil against things like floods and droughts. Mm -hmm. I want to bring on another guest who's studying how rising temperatures affect the soil microbiome, all those bacteria and microbes that live in the soil. Kristen DeAngelis is a microbiologist at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you for having me. So you've been studying an experiment in a forest that's been going on for 20 years where the soil has been artificially heated that entire time. You found that there were spikes in how the microbes were responding. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I've been working on this uh, long-term um, climate change manipulation experiment that was established in uh, 1991 by a collaborator of mine, uh, Jerry Malillo, and they're heating the soil five degrees above ambient. Uh, this is a forest soil in central Massachusetts, um, and it's heated year-round. I don't know, the, the way that they heat it is through these buried resistance cables, and it's the same technology that the NFL uses uh, in, like, the um, uh, football games in the north to keep the snow from accumulating on the field. And so, but there are buried thermistors that keep the experimental plots heated five degrees warmer compared to the controls. And over this 27 years, all of this carbon has been lost as CO2. And, of course, that's a, a positive feedback to climate. Um, and we're really interested in how the microbes are, are responding to this uh, degradation of soil. And how are they responding? Well, um, they're more active. Uh, as you would imagine, you heat up a system, it becomes more active, and the biomass has decreased, the microbial biomass, um, and uh, soils are living. And uh, they're living because of the microbes that live there, and it's mostly bacteria and fungi. And uh, what's interesting, and, and where I come in as a microbiologist really interested in bacteria, um, is that the biomass is decreased in these warm soils but they're really decreased because the fungi are declining and the bacteria, in terms of their numbers, seem to be doing okay. And that's really this next research project of ours is to try and understand uh, how is it the, that the bacteria are, seem to be uh, resilient to this um, uh, warming and drying effect. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that uh, you both spend a lot of time thinking about the soil. What, what are the questions that we need to be asking when you think about the health of the soil in the next 50 years? And Kristen, you can go first. Um, the questions that we need to be asking about um, about soil. Yeah, what what do we need to worry about? What what are the questions? What we sh I know you're doing research on it. What what what's the long term? prognosis. Yeah. Right. So, um, you, you know, keeping soil healthy. And I think this, there's a big uh, debate uh, among uh, uh, academics and farmers right now about how to sort of define what makes a healthy soil. Right. Um, but uh, keeping carbon in the soil, um, promoting practices that promote soil conservation, and really just raising awareness um, of soil as a uh, limiting natural resource. So, you know, questions to be asking is, um, you know, can you um, um, promote uh, planting uh, that will keep uh, erosion at bay, um, promote uh, soil formation, um, and uh, supporting yeah. people in your community who are doing those sorts of things, like our organic farmers in my community, for example. Well, Andrea, how do you bring more? You say you thank us for paying attention to this, and we, we know, think this is something we should be doing, as a matter of fact. How do you bring more attention to people talking about, hey, you, you want to eat, you got to have soil, you know? Yeah, I think, you know, if everyone who's listening today goes out and tells three of their friends about the imperative of soil and that we're losing soil at a rate much faster than we can uh, form it or that it's naturally formed, go tell your friends, raising awareness about that, you know, um, the, the base of 
uh, people who live in rural areas and who are farming, you know, every survey that comes up tends to show that those numbers are declining, which I don't necessarily think is a good thing because we need to have our urban uh, food eaters, you know, we all sit down to eat three times a day, really thinking about how they can support uh, all of those things. And, you know, I, I appreciate the organic debate, organic versus conventional. I don't know that I appreciate it. I think it's much more nuanced than that. I think there's a lot of other ways that we can support producers trying to, I think a lot about just getting continuous cover of the soil. So doing things like having more cover crops, more perennial crops, agroforestry, which is getting trees into landscape. So what are um, what are more of those things that we can do? So it's we've got to move kind of beyond just organic as one option. Um, but I think that consumers being more aware and thinking about how they can support um, food producers in uh, soil conservation, because we do all need to eat yeah. three times a day. Can they learn anything from their home garden plot about any of this, Andrea or Kristen? I mean, is, is that a helpful thing to do? Is become a, have a garden so you're more aware? I I would say so. I mean, I think gardening is a lot of fun, but it's really humbling too. It's not easy to have to grow your own food. So, if you're thinking about you know ways that you can um, use less tillage in your own garden or do things mm -hmm. like mulching to keep weeds down or conserve moisture, I mean, I think you know those are principles that farmers who grow crops on a larger scale are thinking about as well. Mm. So well, we talk, I think it's we, a humbling experience and they can learn some of the basics of soil management in that way too. Yeah, we've talked about the, the water and next time we talk to you, we're going to talk about the wildfires happening out west and how they affect the soil and how the, you know, the soil structure. We've run out of time about that, but that's certainly an interesting topic to talk about also. I would like to thank my guest, Dr. Andrea, uh, Andrea Baish, agricultural scientist at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Dr. Kristen DeAngelis, a microbiologist, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. After the break, imagine being a plant, you're minding your own business, and then someone takes a bite out of you. Turns out the plants don't just sit there and let it happen. I'll tell you what, how, how they feel. Well, you'll, you'll hear. Stay with us. We'll come back after the break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. It's not easy being green. I'm talking about plants. You're dependent on very specific environmental conditions. You can't relocate in search of water. And oh, yeah, everybody wants to eat you, right? What's a motionless organism to do? Well, if you're a plant, you do have some options. You can slow your growth to consume fewer resources. You can develop a deeper root system to get at the water table better. And if a caterpillar is nibbling on your leaf or you as a leaf, you can produce noxious, noxious substances, poisons, bad-tasting chemicals to protect yourself. But one mystery that has puzzled botanists is how a leaf that's been bitten into can tell the rest of the plant to amp up this chemical warfare. Now, new research published in Science points with startling video to a calcium ion signal that travels like electricity to the rest of the plant. You can see it move like a wave from the wounded leaf through the capillaries to other leaves. And you can see it on our website at sciencefriday.com slash plants. Might make you think twice about picking a flower. Here to talk more about this leafy distress signal and more from the secret lives of greenery is Simon Gilroy, professor of botany at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He's co-author on the new research. Welcome, Dr. Gilroy. Uh, good afternoon. Why, why got, what got you looking for this hmm. signal in the first place? Well, so the, the researchers who work with me, the, the team, we're all interested in one set of questions, which is how to plant know what's going on in the world around them. Uh, they have to be really good at it because they're literally rooted to the spot. They have to know what's attacking them, what's happening to them. They have to know things like up from down, a lot of signals being processed. But there's that just fascinating question. They are obviously really good at doing it, but how do they, how do they you know, like using the, the words of how we interact with the world, how do they know and how do they think? How do they turn information into understanding? Uh, so we've been trying to, to piece together the machinery, the cellular machinery that lets them do that for many, many years. And one of the other things that we're, we're very interested in is this universal role for the calcium ion. And you can think of it as it's just a signal that biology worked out a long time ago how to use. 
and uses it everywhere. So the reason your heart is beating at the moment is because flashes of calcium are being released into cells and they're causing contractions. Uh, it's the same thing inside plants, that calcium carries information. So we were just interested in putting those two things together. So what happens when, when a plant gets bitten into it, it releases a spike and it tells the other parts of the plant, is somebody eating me? Yeah, yeah. So that was the, the sort of the miraculous thing that, that we managed to visualize. Is So imagine a caterpillar chewing on the end of one leaf and think about seeing the electrical charges and this calcium ion. Uh, we generated some plants that let us visualize that. And when you chomp on the leaf, you trigger a really quick spike in calcium and then it shoots through the rest of the plant. And for a plant biologist, it is really, really booking. It's going about as fast as we can ma imagine. So it's going in the range of millimeters a second, which is a, for a plant signal is a fantastically fast signal. You know, it, it almost sounds like it has its own nervous system like animals do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we have, so inevitably we start talking in the language of, of sort of nervous system because that's the context that we can really understand. But plants don't have nerves. We should just set the, the goalposts at that. They do not have nerves and they don't have the, the anatomical structure that we would call a brain. So, but they still have to accomplish the same kind of, of things. They, you know, if somebody starts chewing on the tip of your arm, you generate a signal that moves through the rest of your body and your body then responds to it. And usually it's by going like, ow, and moving away. Plants have to do the same kind of thing. They can't respond by movement, but they've got to have the same kinds of systems in there. It's just that the cells that they're built around are going to be very, very different from a mammalian nervous system. Hmm. And, and, and the point is to, to what? To, to tweak up the defense system of the plant, telling the rest of the plant, you know, this is happening? Oh, yeah. Plant, plants are awesome. They, they have a set of defenses that are sitting there. If, they were, if those defenses were on all the time, the plant would be spending a lot of its resources just defending itself for no reason. So it waits for a signal of like, oh, part of me is being eaten. I would really like the rest of me not to be eaten. Signals course through the plant body and they switch on a whole bunch of defenses, things like toxic chemicals, things like uh, proteins that prevent insects from digesting food and but but they're inducible defenses because that way you only switch them on when you need them so is the plant when i eat chomp chomp into a carrot is it still sending out that alarm signal you know absolutely everyone is asking me that and the answer to it is absolutely yes the carrot is alive and when you're eating it it is sending off those signals then the other analogous question that always comes along is that well then when do do i think about that when i'm eating a carrot no i think the carrot just tastes really good it's yeah <laughs> well we know we talk about this communication system underground between plants it's called the the, the world wood system worldwide wood system <laughs> yeah yeah um are the plants talking to each other also oh, i think just... yeah yeah i think that there is some very good data on that there's some very good researchers have looked at how information could be exchanged not within an individual which is kind of, of where our research goes but between individuals and things like uh, volatile chemicals so you if you chew up a leaf it will release chemicals those chemicals are volatile they waft around in the air and other plants can detect them and switch on defenses so plants have these mechanisms to pass information between them absolutely yeah Hmm. Uh, are, are there other kinds of signals we might be able to find in plants based on another kind of stress? I mean, what, what, what does a plant do if it's too hot, for example? Oh, yeah, that's fantastic questions because uh, we are in, in the discovery phase of, of science here. We, we, we really don't know. We know a lot of the signals that plants respond to. And we can kind of describe how it changes their growth. And in a lot of cases, we mm. can describe things like genes which get switched on and off. But how the information is, is passed throughout the plant and processed, we don't know. We, uh, things like temperature shock. Um, one that I'm particularly interested in is, is how the plant sense up from down. All of those kinds of, mm -hmm. of signals, they, we, we are just at the beginning of finding it out.
Our number, 844-724-8255. You can also t- t- tweet us at SciFry, 844-SciTalk on the phones. So, uh, But I'm interested in hearing that you're just beginning to learn this stuff. I mean, we've been studying plants for eons. Oh, Yeah, I, it, it's not that we don't know a lot about plants, and it's not that the researchers um, up until now have, have been sort of like sleeping on the job. That We know a tremendous amount about them, but... It's it's that technology that keeps on advancing. And so now we have technology where we can do things like measure the level of every single gene in a plant. Uh, and now the, the technology that we've been capitalizing on is fairly recent technology, which allows us to put proteins into plants, engineer plants to make these proteins that let us actually see changes in real time in, inside the plant. So we're layering on more and more of the details and the phenomena onto this enormously rich background, which has come from all of the previous research. Yeah, okay, let's talk about what you'd like to know now. What, what would you like to know most? Uh, I, so part of the, the kinds of questions that I'm interested in are, uh, at the nuts and bolts level of the machines that make it work. Inside each of the cells within a plant are a bunch of molecular machines, proteins that make the system work. And our research has just chipped away at one little part of it, which is a group of proteins called uh, glutamate-like receptors that give us an inkling about how the machinery is working. One of the things we'd like to do is be able to to put the details in there to be able to build the map of how it works with the resolution that we have, for instance, about how a nerve works. Uh, Because then we can begin to tinker with the system. And you can imagine that if we understand how the information is being propagated through the plant, we may be able to preemptively switch that system on in a very intelligent way to protect the plant Mm. when we want it to be protected. It's funny you mentioned glutamate because glutamate is what's all all through the brain too, the nervous system too, yep. isn't it? Yeah, this is this is one of those great and and sort of amazing parallels that plants are using glutamate and the proteins that perceive it, which are very very similar to the proteins that perceive glutamate in the nervous system. So there aren't any nerves, but they kind wow. of have the same theme behind what's going on. Wow, I understand you're also doing research on how plants respond to things. In space flight, in space. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I'm, what fascinates I'm, you about that? Yeah. So I'm actually doing the uh, the recording of this in uh, Kennedy Space Center, and we're down here getting ready to send some plants up onto the International Space Station. Uh, space is just a fantastic place to put biology because, you know, if you think of of the evolutionary history of all biology, it's been on the surface of the Earth at one times gravity, and you can't get away from it nothing has evaded one times gravity as far as its its history until we went into space and so we can now remove gravity from the equation go into the weightless environment of for instance the space station and ask what was gravity contributing to biology because when we remove it things that suddenly don't work they become a big deal as far as like oh that's what gravity is regulating on earth and also then if we're going to spend any time in space, and I'm, I mean an extended period of time in space, we're going to have to have a life support system that comes with us. And plants and microbes keep humans alive on Earth. And so the question is, can we take that, that machine with us, that biology of plants and microbes, and make them work in space? So, so you, you, there are so just fundamental things about growing a plant in zero gravity that not only have to do with how the plant stalk grows, but how the water, I imagine, right? Yeah, the Water yeah. is influential and, and it, needs, it needs gravity for it to work and sort of seep down into the soil. It's not seeping anymore. Yeah, I always go, if you think of the simplest thing that you can imagine you do with your potted plant, which is that you water it. So you have a yeah. pot, you have a watering can, you turn the watering can on the side, gravity pulls the water out into the soil and pulls that water down through the soil. And now go into space none of that's going to work. You've got your watering can, you turn on its side, nothing comes out. So how do you physically get the water into the soil? Well, we use things like syringes and pumps. So that, and they work really well. You can push the yeah. water into the soil. And, and you don't use soil. You use a bunch of different matrices, things like clay particles. But the weird, then weird things start happening that you're not prepared for unless you sort of understand the physics of what's going on. But basically, once you've removed gravity, water becomes really sticky and really creepy. So it'll 
stick to surfaces very well and it will also creep along those surfaces so now imagine that you've watered your plant and you've added just a little bit too much water and so that water now sticks to the let's say that you have it in some kind of soil it'll stick to the soil but it will also start creeping along the surface of the soil and it'll start creeping up over the surface of the plant and eventually and this has happened uh in during spaceflight the water will encase the plant it'll be like a watery glove over the surface of the plant and that that is equivalent to flooding the plant that's like trying to grow your plant underwater and that does not work yeah, I hate it when that happens. This is Science <laughs> Friday from <laughs> I'm Ira Flitter. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Well, you know, those are the kinds of things. I have, I'm a gardener. I, I think about gardening all the time. I would never think that that, that water was, was going to do that. And, but also plants need the right mixture, uh, right, don't they? Carbon dioxide and respiration and all that kind of stuff yep. in a different environment. Yep. That's, uh, all part, that's all part of the equation you have to figure out? Yep. And uh, so... The, I, I like the Earth. I think it's a great place to live. I'm happy with how it works. Uh, and once you remove something like gravity and move into the, the realm of spaceflight, a whole bunch of the features which we really, really do take for granted, and you go out into your garden and you look at your plants and they're growing very happily, a lot of the things which are going on don't work quite as well in space. And also, I also think the plants, are, biology is fantastic. Biology copes with going into space. Astronauts, uh, their physiology has changed, but they're able to cope and, and, and deal with that new environment. Plants grow okay in space. It's not that they don't grow. Uh, and biology has this fantastic capacity mm. to sense its environment and adapt. And, and that's what we're seeing. Do, do plants taste differently when they're growing in space? The, uh, at two levels, yes. So one, you know, the taste of plants is partly about how they grow. So how quickly they grow, the nutrients they take up, how much water they have, how much light, the, the, the plant itself. But also, you know when you're on a plane and food tastes differently because you're on the plane? That same phenomenon kind of happens in the space station. So it's a bit like having a head cold. And so those two things play off with each other, how the plants grow and how you as an astronaut are operating change everything a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you're going to try to figure out how gravity exactly affects how s uh, plants grow in space, and possibly um, figure out maybe what will, 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 will plants grow on Mars, for example? Is the soil oh, fertile yeah. enough? Is it? Uh, the, the, they're all great questions to which we kind of know the answer, but you know, like no one's been to Mars, so we haven't tried it. But uh, there's water there. There's minerals, although we probably would have to bring some fertilizer. But some of the characteristic of, of Martian uh, soil, the Martian regolith, is we would have to deal with. So it's very salty. And it has a bunch of chemicals in there because of the weird chemistry, a bunch of chemicals called perchlorates. And those right. are weed killers. So that might be a small issue. But we can get rid of them. We can wash them away. So, yeah. Well, could, could, but, you know, one of the things we think about when we go to Mars is bringing part of Earth to Mars. We don't want to contaminate Mars. Um, it, it, w can you sterilize a seed enough that it wouldn't contaminate but still grow if you wanted to test it out on Mars? Well, so we, we can absolutely sterilize seeds on, as far as the outside of the seed is concerned, which does a pretty good job. We can get them to be sterile. But the thing is that the way that plants grow on Earth is... It, they're in, in a community, and microbes are part of that community. And mm. divorcing plants and microbes is probably not the smartest thing to do because there's a tremendous amount of interactions that make plants grow well that come from the microbial populations in the soil. So that m may just not be the correct strategy to go on down. And that, that's, that's a great point because I wasn't thinking about that. We talk a, a lot on this program about the soil microbiome as being necessary for plants to grow. And you don't have a soil microbiome in, in the natural s space environment, yeah. do you? Do you, yeah. do you have to create that uh, in the space station? No, so you can grow plants under sterile conditions without microbes, and they, they'll grow. You know, I plants, I like I say, biology yeah. is fantastic and they will grow. But the question, it's, it's, the, it's all questions of sustainability and nutrient utilization, how well they're growing. We've only been growing in plants in space intensively for a few years, so we're, we're not really certain that we're good gardeners yet.
Okay. Well, we'll find out. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Gilroy, for taking time to be with us today. My pleasure. Simon Gilroy, professor of botany at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. When we come back, we're going to take you inside the Grand Championship of Science Competitions, the International Science and Engineering Fair. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. Were you a science fair kid? I was. I remember my 11th grade science fair project. I made a little device that read punch cards. You don't know what punch cards are. Well, if you, if you don't know, I, I really can't tell you. But if you do, you will remember. Uh, I actually won second prize in the physics category, and I had no thoughts of ever entering one of the national science fairs, let alone the mother of all science fairs, the International Science and Engineering Fair, or ICEF. And if you've never heard of it, students prepare and compete against other high schools from around the world. And, and the science they're doing is way above my head. It's really on another level. And one recent uh, grand award winner actually developed a method of killing cancer cells. ICEF is like the Olympics of science fairs. There's competition. There, there's a geek science geekery. Sound, sounds like the makings of a great movie, right? Well, a new documentary aptly titled Science Fair follows a group of students, each one more brilliant than the last one, who set out to compete and win at ICEF. Christina Constantini is a producer and director of Science Fair, the new film out in theaters this week. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited did, to be here. Well, did, did you uh, compete in a science fair ever? <laughs> That's right, yeah. In high school, I competed um, two times, and it totally changed my life. And I uh, became obsessed with this little, weird, fun world of science fair nerds. And um, ever since I was 14 years old, I, I knew this would make a great documentary. And then I became a documentary filmmaker, and so um, here we are. <laughs> with the so, so it was it was your own experience then that you that's drew right. upon. That's ex that's exactly right. It was I went to a high school like most high schools in America that really celebrated sports, and um, science fair was the one place where I felt like I was really celebrated, like a football player, <laughs> you know, like a rock star. And 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 this fair in particular is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's 2,000 kids from around the world from 78 different countries, some of the most brilliant minds that you'll ever meet, but they're also teenagers, so they're um, going to dances and they have crushes and, you know, they're, they're also teenagers, so it's, uh, yeah. it's a lot of fun. How far did uh, how far did you get when you were in ICEF? Did you actually get that high up? <laughs> well, I I placed fourth in my category in behavioral wow. science. Wow, that's pretty was... good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you. okay, the movie is terrific. It's, it's a great film. Uh, um, how do, I want to talk about how you chose the schools and the students you were going to follow. Sure. Um, so we follow nine students um, from all over the world. Some students from kind of the Yankees of the science fair, you know, the, the teams that are well-resourced and have um, great coaches. Um, so we, I wanted to show kind of the diversity, and my co-director, Darren Foster, and I um, spent a lot of time interviewing kids from around the world, but we wanted to show, you know, the Yankees, the, the really well-resourced schools, as well as some of the um, mm -hmm. schools with less resources and some kids from um, backgrounds that are not as privileged. So we actually went to a tiny town in the center of Brazil, um, and it was a very poor town, and for them, the, go, making it to the International Science Fair was life-changing. Mm -hmm. I want to bring on a contestant, Robbie Barrett, a former ICEF student featured in the film. Welcome to Science Friday. Hey, thanks for having me. How, what got you interested, and in, how, did, how did you get into ICEF, into the competition? So to get to ISEF, you need to win uh, your state fair or a regional fair. So I got through by, by winning my state fair. Hmm. And, uh, you, and you mentioned in the movie, you, you talked about, you actually struggled in math in high school, though, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, um, I mean, I think my main problem with that was because it's math class is, is it's super structured. So I can't, like, you know, it's, if it's not interesting, if it's just, like, you know, do 20 math problems or something, I'm not very good at that. But if it's, like, a project where um, the first year I went to ISEF, I had a number theory project. Um, but if it's, you know, something where I can sort of do my own pace and do stuff that I'm interested in, then I'm really good at it. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember from my own day, back in the day when I was in the, doing science fairs just in high school level, the competition was amazing. <laughs> I mean, the pressure, I can only imagine, uh, Robbie and Christina, what it must be like at this level. Robbie, what's it like? 
Uh, well, yeah, there there are definitely some people that um that are super competitive, but but there are also you know there's a bunch of really nice like-minded people at, at ISF, and uh, I think I got I got along with most people really well. And Christina? Yeah, I think you know that the, there are diff- a lot of different kinds of kids. There are kids who are uber competitive and who are there to win, and for them this is like their Olympics. And then there are kids probably like Robbie and I were when we, you know, I'm from Wisconsin, and I had no idea that this international science fair existed. So when I got there, I was just happy to be there, you know, just like uh, mm-hmm. just amazed that something could exist at this scope. Um, it's really just incredible to see rows and rows and rows of, of projects of brilliant kids. It's super, super inspiring. Mm-hmm. Just want to get our listeners, if they want to tell us about their run-ins <laughs> with science fairs, 844-724-8255. Um, I was also impressed by, you seem to follow one of the teachers in, in, in the schools and how she was shepherding her classmates in there. I think it was, she was from Jericho High School, was she not? That's right. Yeah, Dr. Serena McCullough from Jericho, New York. Yeah, and having, as someone who grew up in Long Island, I know exactly what Jericho <laughs> High School is, a great school. Um, but you, you spent a lot of time having her students practice their presentations. I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, she is. um, What I love about Jericho High School is they treat science fair like the rest of America treats football. It's really, she um, is an amazing coach, and she drills them over and over again. And they, you know, she she finds out what they're interested in, and then she reads all of the journals that she can find that are in that same area so she can help her kids as much as she possibly can. And she's kind of an amazing model of, of teaching. She's incredible. And uh, one, one interesting aspect I thought about that uh, uh, is while she's trying to teach her students how to be good at public speaking and presentation, that's really the, the we talk about scientists or researchers today, we talk about as that being one of their greatest shortcomings. Yeah. I, is it? I think They're selling your pro- presentation. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I think, you know, I, uh, I think Anjali says it that par- part of science fair is being a good salesman. So part, you know, you have to um, figure out how to sell your project, how to communicate ideas to experts, how to convince them that y- y- that you've done um, important work. And I think they're great life skills. Um, even yeah. I, you know, I didn't become a scientist, but many of the lessons I learned from science fair, I, I think I I use a lot. <laughs> And, and, and Robbie, what lessons have you taken away from this competition? So, well, I mean, I'm coming from, I grew up in West Virginia, so I thought that I was pretty disadvantaged. But when, when you go to science fair and you see all of these kids from all over, like from Brazil and from, you know, over in um, like lesser fortunate countries over, you know, in Asia and, you know, towards like the Middle East, uh, it really is eye-opening and, and humbling. Um, that, you know, all of these kids have so many, like, shortcomings and have overcome so much, but, you know, they're competing on international science fair, and a lot of them have already won, like, their national fair. So it was, it was a bit humbling, and my perspective definitely shifted. Mm-hmm. As someone who, who uh, has not gotten into a, a, a college and still looking to get into college, um, there was some of the, some of the contestants were, were looking at the science fair as a gateway to open up their way of getting into college. Ha- have you been able to overcome not, be, not getting into a college? And what have you been doing since graduating high school? So, um, first of all, I've, I really wasn't looking at science fair as you know, a reason to get into college. I was just doing it because, you know, it's fun and and it was an excuse for me to work on projects that that I really loved. Um, But as for what I've been doing outside of, you know, going to college, which which I'm not, uh, so right now I'm working in a research lab at Stanford. I'm working in a Pravesh Khatri's lab. Uh, It's more biology oriented, but I'm working a lot with artificial intelligence pertaining to that. Hmm. Can I brag about Robbie? Just Please go ahead, <laughs> I know he won't brag for himself. Um, he <laughs> actually is. He has an art show in Paris that's going up. He was on the cover of Bloomberg Business Week with AI-generated paintings. He's doing. He's le- guest lecturing at Stanford. He hasn't got into college, but he's doing incredible, amazing things. I'm not sure he needs college <laughs> at this point. I was going to say, if you can get into ISAF and survive that a couple of times and go out on your own, maybe college College is highly overrated. <laughs> <You know? That's right. laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, Robbie. Well, I, I do, I do, I do really still want to go to college. Um, as Christina said, I'm I'm working a lot more at the intersection of artificial intelligence and art. So, um, 
I, I've been thinking about going to art school, but then that is also a problem because they don't really offer math classes, and I need math to do, you know, to work in, in the medium of AI. Um, so, so it's a bit tricky, but I'm, I'm figuring it out. But I do, I do still want to go to college. I'm not writing that completely off. Mm-hmm. Uh, t- tell, us, uh, tell us about one of your projects. You know, you 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 uh, you were there a few times. Let me let me bring one up. You had you you uh, in the film they show you demonstrating a song lyric generator. That, oh, that yes. looked kind of cool. So so that isn't that isn't my science fair project. That's just uh, an art project that I was doing on this side. So basically, uh, I use neural networks, which are a sort of machine learning. But um, the the short brief idea is with typical programming, you think of you know, programmers sitting down and coding rules into the computer, maybe about writing songs, like, you know, the different lines have to rhyme or whatever. But with neural networks, what happens is you can just show the neural network a bunch of data, and it will figure out the patterns in that data, right? And then you can use that to generate more. So in this case, the data is, I used all of Kanye West's rap lyrics, and I sort of got the neural network to look at all the patterns in those, and then generate more rap lyrics. Wow. And I, w- I want to talk about one of the more interesting, I mean, not that it all wasn't interesting, but one of the more poignant moments in the film is the time where one of the students in the film who won the top prize in her category, she didn't have a science teacher as her mentor. She had to get her school's football coach to sponsor her. And when she wins this top prize in her category, she's not even recognized by her high school for winning, Christina. Yeah, I mean, Kashfia's story is one of um, the most heartbreaking to me, Um, but she is a brilliant, brilliant young woman, and I think the silver lining of the story, despite the fact her the high school she's in doesn't recognize it. There, are, There's this figure of Coach Schmidt who, uh, despite knowing nothing about science, <laughs> he even, you know, watching hi- him try to understand what she's done is, is, is pretty funny. But um, he is incredibly supportive, and so he does mm-hmm. whatever she needs him to do in order for her project to go far. And he's even, you know, the head of the feminist club at <laughs> this high school. He is a head football coach, but he's he's so much more, I think, to the kids um, mm-hmm. who need his support. I'm Ira Flater. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios, uh, talking about uh, science fairs and uh, talking about the new film, uh, Christina Constantini, producer and director of uh, Science Fair. Where can we see this film? when it starts coming out, Christina? Um, well, it it opens tonight in New York City um, at the Landmark 57. It will open September 21st in Los Angeles and uh, many other uh, cities around the country on September 28th. Mm. And if you look at sciencefairfilm.com, you can find a, a, a screening list there. Mm. How did you how did you go from being an I, an ISAF participant to becoming <laughs> a filmmaker? Was it a torturous road? <laughs> I was you know I was in the social sciences, so I've always been interested in people and how people think and why people do what they do. So it, it wasn't a huge leap, but in college um, I I made the shift from social sciences to journalism, and but I've still you know really appreciated and I'm so grateful for my experiences that I had as a high schooler in science fair. And so to me, this is a bit of a, a love letter to that world. So you, you, you consider this film to be a celebration of e- science fair. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I think uh, they do wonder, wonderful things for kids, whether or not kids become science, scientists or not. I think they teach so many important skills, and um, mm. I wouldn't be here without science fair. <laughs> do you feel that it's... Some people, some people feel that it's not right that we should treat science as a competition. You know, it's okay for sports or debating team but not science. How do you respond to those folks? You know, I think actually Robbie in the movie says it best, um, which is that if you think that that science fair is about winning, you're totally missing the point of science fair. And uh, there is a competitive nature to it, and I do think, you know, whether we like it or not, a competition gets kids in the doors. Uh, I think kids are competitive, and um, it's certainly part of why I did it. But in the end, mm-hmm. I, I found it to be such a meaningful experience, um, and just the the self explore or the exploration and innovation that comes out of these fairs is absolutely remarkable. And a lot of it is collaborative in nature. There are mm-hmm. a lot of group projects, so I think you also have you have competition, but you also have a ton of collaboration. Robbie, your thoughts? I, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. Um, I mean, if you if you think about science fair, like 
if you're just going there to compete, you that's not the point. Um, I mean, I made a lot of really great connections at Science Fair. I got a, really, a bunch of really good feedback on my project. Um, and, you know, while, while people are there just to put it on their college applications, um, there, there's a lot more that you can get out of it. Mm -hmm. do, you think, uh, do you think that enough people have, um, I guess, promoted science fairs enough? I mean, we hear about the big ICEF one. Do, are there enough science fairs in colleges or in high school, do you think? N you well, I mean, at my Robbie, high school, yeah. at my high school, nobody knew about science fair. I think I might... I think I was the first person from my high school to go to ISEF. But, um, but yeah, no, it was, I mean, at least at my high school, it was wildly uh, unheard of. Hmm. Um, but that, that did change after, after I went the first time. There was, like, a science fair club that one of the science teachers started to try and get more participation. But I, I, feel, like, I feel like it definitely is something that needs more coverage, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I w you know, I think um, the science in the International Science Fair um, just lost their primary funder um, last year, um, and the Siemens competition, which is a very big science fair, also is closing down after decades. Oklahoma State Science Fair just lost their funding, and I think you know we're at a time when um, we need to be reminded of the importance of these kinds of programs for kids. And so, so part of my desire for doing this movie was to remind mm -hmm. people just how much this means to so many kids. Yeah, it's a good way to end it, and uh, and we'll be uh, hoping f folks go to see Science Fair opening tonight in New York and then across the country. Christina Constantini is producer and director of Science Fair, and Robbie Barrett is two-time former ICEF participant now working at Stanford. One last thing before we go, Cy Fry is here in Salt Lake City because we've got a very special show planned tomorrow night at Saturday night at the Eccles Theater downtown. We're going to talk about exotic organisms living in forest canopies, like my favorite, the orchids. We'll take you along on a dino dig in southern Utah, and there's a lot, lots more. We're going to, it's going to be a great geek evening. We're going to have conversation, science, and live music. You don't want to miss it. There are just a few tickets left. More info at sciencefriday.com slash Salt Lake City. That is Saturday night. It's going to be great at the Eccles Theater. Be there or be square. B.J. Liederman composed our theme music. And our thanks today to KUER for welcoming us today. Michael Havey, uh, Louis Downey, and Tim Slover. And a heartfelt farewell to our departing intern, Lucy Wong. Today is her last day. Our thanks to her. She will be missed. Good luck.